Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So today I'm going to be looking at classic twofers. This is an idea for a video which I had probably about two years ago and uh, it's taken me this long to get to uh, actually do the video. Don't have a great number of these, only got a few. I thought it would be an interesting topic. It's not one that I've seen done before uh, on the vinyl community. Doesn't mean it hasn't been done, just means I haven't seen it. So the twofer, you all know what that is. It's the classic uh, twin album set two albums by a particular artist that were repackaged, done as a gatefold sort of double album. Now the first one I'm going to show is not strictly speaking a twofer. It is a twofer but it's a bit of a strange one. This is the first one I ever got and um, I got it when I was a child and um, it's this, A Nice Pair by Pink Floyd. Now this is a twofer except it's not a twofer because the strict definition of a twofer to me is where the actual album itself as released does not have its own identity. It's literally two albums that have been stuck together. And usually uh, the front um, of the jacket is the um, it's one of the records and on the back it's the other. This one came out in 1974, I think, and it was basically I think it was I think it was partly at least an attempt to get Sid Barrett some royalties, because at that point he'd been inactive for a while, living at the um the Hilton Hotel in London and blowing all his money. So the Floyd organisation had the idea to repackage two of his, uh, well, the two first Pink Floyd albums as a double set. So uh, you had this thing going on where um, you had, it was the inner sleeve which acknowledged the uh, the original heritage of the album. So obviously you've got the Piper at the Gates of Dawn on the front and then you've got the cover for Source Full of Secrets on the, well, rear, front and rear. There's no particular way of knowing which is which. Not particularly wonderful um, recreations of the original artwork. The kind of yeah, they are black and white actually, so uh, not wonderful in that sense. But um, certainly a very seminal release, I think. I mean, I got this in I think it would have been 1979 or 1980, probably 1980. And um, for lots of people back in '74, even this would have been the first time that they'd have heard the classic early Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd broke big with Dark Side of the Moon in around about 72, something like that. So this would have come out a couple of years later. And the music obviously was very different to the music that they were doing uh, by the time of Dark Side. So this was, you know, for many people, this was the first their first exposure to the Barrett era Floyd. Um, wonderful record, one of my all-time favourite albums. Possibly the one more than any other, maybe apart from a dad's copy of Revolver, which I would grab if the house burnt down. Um, I just love the kind of, um, just the ironic artwork and some of the shots are really beautiful, you know, like this shot of the flying saucers there and the um, the fork in the road. I love the tea and the frog in the throat, all good stuff. And of course a bit of naughtiness with the um, nice pair thing going on. But you can see at the top actually it just says, it does say the pipe with the gates are drawn and sort of full of secrets there. So anyway, not quite a twofer, a twofer but done in a different way to most twofers. Okay, so the next one, I'm gonna go roughly chronologically with these in terms of when I bought them. So this is one, one of the best items in my collection. I love this twofer, absolutely love it. This is the first album by The Move, and then on the rear you've got uh, Shazam, the artwork for the original Move album. You can see the original lineup there. You've got Ace Kefford, Bev Bevan, Roy Wood, um, Carl Wayne there, another picture of Carl Wayne there. Um, yeah, the original lineup, and then by the time they did the second album, you've got uh, the truncated lineup of um, Roy Wood and Bev Bevan, Carl Wayne, Carl Wayne and um, Rick Price. So the move never really took off as an albums band. They never really sold albums, but their albums are actually quite good fun. The first move album has got some cracking stuff on it. It's just one of those records that you put on to cheer yourself up, really. It's just so good. It kind of zings along at such a pace. Starts out with Yellow Rainbow. Uh, by Roy Wood, Kilroy Was Here by Roy Wood, fantastic song. Here We Go Around the Lemon Tree by Roy Wood, which was covered later, or uh, about the same time by the Idol Race, Jeff Lynne's band. You've got Flowers in the Rain, Fire Brigade, Useless Information, and the early version of Cherry Blossom Clinic, which then turned up on the Shazam record, which is a very, very different album. Saw the move going into a more transitional, um, underground kind of sound, you know, Shades of Black Sabbath, Early Sabbath, and... Um, a very influential record. You can hear this in all kinds of uh, sort of heavy, heavy music from America, particularly in the early 70s. You know, listen to Blue Oyster Cult, you'll definitely hear shades of um, some of these songs. Hello Susie, 
which was covered by Amen Corner. They did a very poppy version of it, but the move's original version has got these grinding riffs in it. Beautiful Daughter, which is a Roy Wood song, uh, sung by Carl Wayne, is just a fantastic song. I would say almost on a footing with um, Eleanor Rigby. You know, it's that good. It's just a wonderful lyrical song. Then the revamped version of Cherry Blossom Clinic, which goes through all these different classical sections, you know, bits of Bach coming through, um, clearly shades of ELO are already on the table. But the highlight of this record for me, side two, has got the Moves version of The Last Thing on My Mind, which is a Tom Paxton song, but they turn it into this probably about a six or seven minute epic, wonderful winding guitars, and it's just, just incredible. I had it on a cassette back in the day, and I just wore the cassette out in the car, you know, just driving around. So anyway, yeah, Shazam, The Move, classic twofer, love it, and... Um, it's a good one. So this one I bought, I think, about two or three years ago from a shop uh, in Morecambe called Vintage Vinyl. And this is Kevin Ayres featuring Mike Oldfield and David Bedford. And it's his two albums, The Joy of a Toy and Shooting at the Moon. And um, I've never owned either of these records in their original form, so I don't know how the packaging compares. But inside, you've got one side like that one side uh, with a picture of Kevin Ayres. This one again is on Harvest like the Floyd one and just a wonderful pair of albums so Kevin Ayres obviously he was from the soft machine and he specialized in a kind of um, ooh, I don't know folky fruity quite posh sounding ironic English pop with some baroque flourishes bit of sight creeping in bit of kind of classical stuff real kind of mixture he's a kind of less unhinged version of Sid Barrett a less melancholy version of Nick Drake, but he's certainly got that kind of plummy kind of sound to his voice. Of these two records, it's The Joy of a Toy, which I know best. Uh, I need to explore Shooting at the Moon a little bit more, but um, Joy of a Toy's got some tremendous songs on it. Um, Stop This Train again doing it on side two, just got a wonderful rolling groove to that. And, you know, there's some classic English whimsy, Eleanor's Cake, which ate her. It's kind of not a million miles away from the very early David Bowie, I guess. Um, song for Insane Times at the end of side one is probably the best song on the record. All kinds of amazing musicians on this album. You've got Robert Wyatt, you've got David Bedford, Lol Coxhill, the great English improviser, Mike Oldfield. Just a great pair of records. And uh, I picked that up from Vintage Vinyl in Morecambe. Really good price. It's in beautiful condition. And um, yeah, that's a classic. That's a classic twofer. This next one, uh, I do actually own one of the records. Um, this is, where did I get this from? I can't remember where this came from now, but um, it's this, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, actually, I should start with this one because this is the first one chronologically. This is Unicorn. Uh, and then on the back, you've got um, a Beard of Stars. Now, I do have a Beard of Stars, got a very, very battered copy of it, which is, the actual vinyl is okay, but the jacket is falling apart. It's seen better days, so it was nice to get this, uh, to have you know a nice jacket for that, and I didn't have that one, so um, that was good. And the packaging, again, I don't know how it compares to the packaging on the original records, but um, you've got the guys from the band. So, of course, this is the original version of uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, where Mark Bolin was still doing his weird trippy brand of elfin folk tremendous stuff on this record uh, sorry on um on unicorn this is the record that ends with the kind of weird story read by john peel it's a kind of strange a.n milne style weird story with john meal's plummy tones reading it out but um yeah real hippy trippy stuff you know she was born to be a unicorn and um the throat of winter very atmospheric. The songs all kind of blend together. They're all kind of essentially just variations on the same song, really. It's just Mark playing, I would imagine, open tune guitar and just singing these lyrics, which he doesn't enunciate very well. So it all becomes almost like kind of scat singing, very mysterious, very um, trippy, very psychedelic, very, very English. The misty coast of Albany. Um, but then on um, Beard of Stars, he starts to introduce the electric guitar into it, which is really interesting. So obviously, 
he was going to go on to do T-Rex, which was a totally different band, really. It was a different lineup, different style of music, and of course it was very electrified. So Beard of Stars, I guess, is a bit of a transitional album. Elemental Child on the end of side two is the one which he really turns on the hard, scrubby electric guitars. It's very kind of bluesy, very sort of raw, really. But um, wonderful track list on this record. Track seven by the light of a magical moon on, on side one is just fantastic. Um... He was a great melodist, a great lyric writer in his way, and these, you know, these early albums were a great example of his genius, I think. So um, that's a nice one to have. Wonderful. OK, two more. So this one I picked up from my local antiques place last year. I was really happy to pick it up because I've never yet seen a copy of Rock Bottom uh, in the wild. So I've been on the lookout for it. This is Robert Wyatt, Rock Bottom. I had it on CD for many years, but... Um, I'd never seen it, so I grabbed this one. Really good price, this. I think I got this for about £20. So I got Rock Bottom and then Ruth is Stranger Than Richard, um, which is one of his other albums. May have been a couple of albums later, I'm not entirely sure. But um, anyway, so um, a fairly blank kind of inner for this one. The artwork for Robert's Records was always done by his wife, Alfie. So, um, you know, very warm, funny kind of artwork on that one and that one is a very mysterious cover um, lots of detail I'm assuming a pencil drawing of some kind so um, yeah so obviously this is the record that Robert Wyatt made shortly after he fell from an upstairs window and broke his back he'd been a drummer fantastic jazz drummer in um, Soft Machine broke his back confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life I think the, his doctor told him he only had about 20 years to live or something and he's still going strong now he must be in his 70s 80s but he wrote most of this record on a toy keyboard i think from his hospital bed um got nick mason from pink floyd to produce it and turned it into this very again very english psychedelic strange hard to describe album you know orchestral elements elements of jazz you know mingus style jazz he was a big jazz head elements of folk as well though quite free form and bringing in improvisational textures and techniques but doing it in a kind of orchestrated way and uh, it's quite kind of oceanic you can lose yourself in it Robert Wyatt has got this very quiet unassuming very very uh, distinctive voice which comes through the mix in kind of kind of dazed ironic kind of tones wonderful stuff he sort of he is an acquired taste, really. I mean, I, I, you know, I know some people who can't stand Robert Wyatt, but um, anyway, this record probably a lesser work, but still got some fine songs on it. Um, it's a bit more, um, well, a bit less orchestrated, a bit more kind of small band ensemble kind of sound. Um, um, you've got members of Soft Machine on here again. And uh, Brian Eno on direct inject anti jazz ray gun. Um, but uh, certainly some nice songs on here. I'd say a lesser album than Rock Bottom, but um, still quite a nice one. So, um, yeah, good one to have in the collection. And then this one, again, um, so with this, again, bought from my antiques place last year. I didn't own this record, this is the band. I did, or I do still own that one, the Brown album. I've had, um, I've had that one on vinyl for many years, but I did not uh, have this one. So it was good to um, get these two done as a pair. And this one's got quite a nice uh, inner gatefold there. Here are the guys. Uh, so yeah, what to say about this really? That hasn't been said before. Just great proto-Americana. Um, there are some people who say that's the better one. There are some people who say that's the better one. I can see arguments for both sides. I always tend to go for this one, really. It's the first one I got into back in the day. Really didn't like it when I first heard it. It wasn't, um, it was very strange. Didn't have any frames of reference for it at all, really, back in, it would have been the kind of mid 90s when I heard it. Very pungent, very distinctive sound. Not really like anything I listened to up to that point, and it took a while. Um, but then it clicked. Great songs on the Brown album, obviously. The Unfaithful Servant, wonderful melody in that track. Whispering Pines, Upon Cripple Creek, you know, just fantastic songs by uh, Robbie Robertson. 
music from Big Pink obviously has got some classics as well. You've got um, The Wait, which is you know the most famous song, I would say, probably. And a wonderful version of I Shall Be Released at the end, which I think is sung by Richard Manuel. So um, great artwork, timeless music, and um, good to have them on a twofer. Okay, so that's my selection of twofers. Be really interested to see if anybody's got any different ones or the same ones. That will do as well. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed the video. Stay safe.